Fans of the Diablo series are already intimately familiar with the tragedy that befell the townsfolk of Tristram. Your death will be avenged. With the town's subsequent destruction at the hands of the fallen warrior, a new vessel for the Lord of Terror himself. And although we learned the various grisly fates of the inhabitants of Tristram, an ongoing mystery remains. Why was there originally a fully voiced character named Tremaine the Priest, who, despite having a secret yet vital role in town, and his very own quest, plus hints to his remains in Diablo 2, was he ultimately removed? In today's video, we will explore these questions and more in the untold truth of the tragic rise and fall of the cut character Tremaine the Priest from Diablo 1. Unfortunately, when approaching the restored Tremaine to learn more about the absentee priest thanks to the Beelzebub mod, his only dialogue option present is a single, somber greeting. All I can do now is pray for us all. Although later in the video, we will learn more about Tremaine's own dedicated cut quest, which is thankfully fully voiced, there is a reason why this enigmatic priest's dialogue is actually so sparse. Tremaine was reported to originally appear late in game, only when the player had emerged from the caves level to be precise, just when the Hellmouth in town opened. But why, you ask? Well, unsurprisingly, to understand what exactly Tremaine was doing in Tristram during Diablo's occupation, or more accurately, outside of Tristram for the bulk of the game, we needn't guess at all, but instead can piece together his purpose and placement thanks to the various recorded dialogue from villagers that never made it into the final game concerning the Wayward Priest. Thanks to Adria the Witch, we learn. Faith is absolute belief in the unseen. The priest Tremaine is from a holy order long asleep in this land. He keeps a promise and a charge issued ages ago and sustains a union with realms that even my vision cannot reach. He knows much, but not as much as he believes. We later discover that Tremaine's order was that of the Zacharum faith, the exact same order that was corrupted by Mephisto back in Kurast that compelled the Archbishop Lazarus to have King Leoric and his subjects relocate to Diablo's Soulstone resting place, much to the chagrin of Farnham. I have an elderly priest around there, and if I did, I'd kick him right in the... <laughs> Can't even keep a church free of those hell-spawn bastards. What good are they on? Those holy men. Liars. Liars! So... Does that mean Tremaine's personal faith is compromised, like his brethren Lazarus? Well, unlike the rest of the townsfolk, Tremaine does not seem to be bound to Tristram whatsoever, which explains his reported absence in-game. As the various townsfolk comment, The priest Tremaine is a bit of a mystery. He certainly never stays here, and he often comes and goes to many of the nearby towns. Yeah, Tremaine! He gets around, doesn't he? Or haven't you heard? My friends in some of the other towns say that he passes through, picking up a few books here, a pinch of bat claw there. Never seems to have the problems most do getting in and out of Tristram, that's for sure. I really don't know much about the priest Tremaine. He never visits the tavern, preferring to keep to the company of Pepin and Cain. Perhaps it is because they too have more scholarly pursuits. The priest Tremaine? Ah, oh, he's a solitary fellow who has no time for most of us. He seems to prefer the company of Pepin or Cain. Ah, and that's fine by me. I respect his passion and his commitment to his order, but I've no time for his prattling. Indeed, if we speak to Pepin the Healer, he sings His Holiness's praise like a bird. His Holiness is a wondrous man of great knowledge and understanding. He has shown me many cures for rare and deadly diseases. He brings me books and reagents for my work whenever he can, but I fear that he may someday take on some task that is too great even for him. But what task could Tremaine possibly take on that would be too great? And is Pepin's judgment compromised as well, seeing as he used to be a priest underneath Lazarus? Now, we will circle back to Tremaine's personal relationship with Lazarus as it plays a vital role in his backstory and motivations. But first, if we are to know Tremaine's true alignment, 
The more pressing question which Cain poses being, why is he alone allowed to travel to Tristram unmolested? Tremaine is an occasional visitor to our town and seems to have a little problem coming and going. It is strange how at times anyone who tries to leave Tristram is hunted down and slain by the cloaked riders, and at other times it is a simple matter to leave. I think it is that uncertain fear that keeps some of us here, but we are glad for Tremaine's bravery and luck in keeping some contact with the rest of the kingdom. The true reason why some villagers were bound to be kept hostage in town was as Cain inadvertently divined due to fear, or more accurately, terror itself. Which I covered in an entire video, but for now, as stated in an abridged section of the Diablo 1 manual, and read in my best warrior impression. Not long after Leoric took possession of Candorus, a power long asleep awakened within the dark recesses beneath the monastery. Sensing that freedom was within his grasp, Diablo entered the nightmares of the Archbishop and lured him into the dark, subterranean labyrinth. In his terror, Lazarus raced through the abandoned hallways until he at last came to the chamber of the burning soul stone. No longer in command of his body or spirit, he raised the stone above his head and uttered words long forgotten in the realm of mortals. His will destroyed. Lazarus shattered the soul stone upon the ground. Diablo once again came into the world of man. Although he was released from his imprisonment within the soul stone, the Lord of Terror was still greatly weakened from his long sleep and required an anchor to the world. Once he had found a mortal form to wear, which eventually was the young Prince Albrecht, he could begin to reclaim his vastly depleted power. Travelers on the road surrounding Tristram were accosted by cloaked riders that seemed to now constantly roam the deserted countryside. Many villagers fled Tristram, making their way to other towns or kingdoms, fearing some unnamed evil that seemed to wait in the shadows all around them. Those few who chose to remain seldom ventured out at night and never tread foot upon the grounds of the cursed monastery. Whispered rumors of poor, innocent people being abducted in the night by wicked, nightmarish creatures filled the halls of the local inn with no king, no law, and no army left to defend them. Many of the townsfolk began to fear an attack from the things that now dwelt beneath their town. The Archbishop Lazarus, frayed and disheveled, returned from his absence and assured the townsfolk that he too had been ravaged by the growing evil of the monastery. Their desperate need for reassurance clouding their good judgment, Lazarus whipped the townspeople into a frenzied mob, reminding them that Prince Albrecht was still unaccounted for. He persuaded many of the men to follow him into the depths of the monastery to search for the boy. They armed themselves with shovels, picks, and scythes, and so prepared, they both boldly followed the treacherous archbishop straight into the fiery maw of hell itself. The few who survived the horrible fate that awaited them returned to Tristram and recounted what they could of their ordeal. Their wounds were terrible, and even the skills of the healer could not save some of them. As the stories of demons and devils spread, a stifling, primal terror began to consume the hearts of the town's inhabitants. It was a terror that none of them had ever known. Deep beneath the foundations of the ruined monastery, Diablo gorged himself upon the fears of the mortals above him. He slowly sank back into the welcoming shadows and began to harness his depleted power. He smiled to himself in the sheltering darkness, for he knew that the time of his final victory was fast approaching. Diablo didn't just use dark emotions to ensnare the unsuspecting citizens paralyzed by fear, as we know why the other townsfolk were not allowed to leave Tristram. Like Sauron's enigmatic Nazgul, Diablo employed enforcers unseen in game called the Dark slash Cloaked Riders, who hunt down unwanted interlopers that visited Tristram as first mentioned in the game's manual and Ogden's opening speech. Thank goodness you've returned. Much has changed since you lived here, my friend. All was peaceful until the Dark Riders came and destroyed our village. Many were cut down where they stood, 
and those who took up arms were slain or, or dragged away to become slaves or worse. Conversely, Wirt's ability to trade would prove that Dark Riders didn't mindlessly attack all visitors. In case you haven't noticed, I don't buy anything from Tristram. I am an importer of quality goods. If you want to peddle your junk, you'll have to see Griswold, Pepin, or that witch Adria. I'm sure they'll snap up whatever you can bring them. So why wasn't a priest of all people who, superficially, seemed to be an ardent defender of the light, hunted down and exterminated on sight like a dog by the marauding demons in charge of Tristram's unholy border patrol? The reason Tremaine seemed to survive despite his religious affiliation is admittedly somewhat theoretical. However, as we learn more of his backstory, it becomes more apparent he was arguably perhaps the greatest threat to Diablo's return. But how? Although Diablo 1's timeline is pretty shaky, we do know the following for certain. The countryside of Tristram was overrun with demons roughly four years earlier, as stated by Cain. Ogden has owned and run the Rising Sun Inn and Tavern for almost four years now. He purchased it just a few short months before everything here went to hell. The demons retreated mostly to the church and created a cursed quarantine of Tristram's town, allowing the weakened Diablo to recuperate and to feed on the terror of the inhabitants, regaining his strength in his new host, Prince Ulbricht, so he could later free his brothers. Furthermore, the events of Diablo 1 take place not too long after Ulbricht was dragged into the labyrinth thanks to the treachery of the Archbishop Lazarus. Abandon your foolish quest. All that awaits you is the wrath of my master. You are too late to save the child. Now you will join him. I was there when Lazarus led us into the labyrinth. He spoke of holy retribution. But when we started fighting those hellspawn, he did not so much as lift his mace against them. He just ran deeper into the dim, endless chambers that were filled with the servants of darkness. And as a puppet of Diablo, Lazarus undoubtedly downplayed the danger to his fellow Zacharoon brother-in-arms. Congruently, originally Tremaine had two not one, but two conflicting quests, and we will soon explore why they were conflicting, but more pressing. It was originally Tremaine who activated the Lazarus quest. There's no doubt it was a stinging betrayal for the priest, realizing that the Archbishop was but a pawn for Diablo under his nose the entire time. And although during the final release, it was Cain who would bequeath the player with the infamous Lazarus quest, originally it was Tremaine saying, I seek a champion to undertake a serious duty, and the people of this town speak well of your courage and skill. The Archbishop Lazarus, once King Leoric's most trusted advisor and a member of our order, has taken the path of evil. Not long ago, Lazarus led a party of simple townsfolk into the labyrinth to find the king's missing son, Albrecht. Only a few of them escaped with their lives. Curse me for a fool! I should have suspected his veiled treachery then, for I have learned that it was Lazarus himself who kidnapped Leoric's son and has since hidden him within the labyrinth. I still don't understand why the Archbishop has turned to the darkness, or what his interest is in Albrecht. Unless he means to sacrifice him at the full moon. That must be what he has planned. The survivors of his rescue party say that Lazarus was last seen in the deepest bowels of the labyrinth, some 16 levels beneath the cathedral. You must hurry and save the prince from the sacrificial blade of this demented fiend. In fact, like the quest Map of the Stars, which would have you kill Diablo in a certain time frame, or doomed the town as he regained full power, which was later abandoned as having a timer made things difficult for players. I am sure that you tried your best, but I fear that even your strength and will may not be enough. Diablo is now at the height of his earthly power. If we returned early to Tremaine, he would urge us to continue with our quest. Why do you delay? Time is of the essence. The prince and the people of this kingdom are counting on you. 
perhaps more telling, there was indeed a failure return speech that seems to indicate the original Lazarus quest had a fail state if the boy you found was sacrificed and not saved as Tremaine would state. This is terrible! Lazarus will surely burn in hell for his horrific deed. Although the boy that you describe may not be our prince, I believe that Albrecht may yet be in danger. Whatever vile power lies beneath the ground has assuredly secured its foothold in our world. All I can do now is pray for us all. If we successfully fell the bastard Archbishop Betrayer, that this ends here, Betrayer. I believe having Tremaine deliver this line versus Cain was much more fitting. So, Lazarus has paid the price for his betrayal and justice is served. For your services this day, I bestow this mace unto you. Its name is Lightforge, and it is the holiest of our order's artifacts. As I am the last of this order, I entrust it to you. May the light guide you. With Tremaine's final blessing and Lazarus's earlier mentioned mace, Lightforge, the hero would presumably be sent off to the final quest to slay the Lord of Terror. So the two questions to tackle from here are, why was the quest conflicting with an earlier quest even before Tremaine was cut from the final game? And what about the priest? Would Lazarus, or even perhaps Diablo, fear? Well, as players are intimately aware, the Archbishop Lazarus was the penultimate quest in Diablo 1. The final release of the game also still features a random grouping of quests that only a certain amount can be activated per playthrough. For example, if you started a new game of Diablo and saw that the well was poisoned, then you would get the poisoned water supply, but not the Skeleton King quest. Conversely, if you saw that the water was blue, that meant that you would receive the Skeleton King mission. However, I have to note the Beelzebub mod that I play doesn't have that problem, it just allows you to do every quest on every run. Which is not only greatly appreciated, but also why my game looks different possibly to yours, and it is linked in the description below. I highly Highly recommend it. So back to the cluster of randomized quests, it was believed that the Archbishop Lazarus quest itself was either originally not intended to be able to be accessed in every playthrough, or possibly Cain would take over the absentee Tremaine's role. And the reason was that Tremaine would not always be present at that time. And now we're going deeper into the rabbit hole asking why, unlike any other townsfolk present, was Tremaine absent by the time Diablo was slain. Unfortunately, it was Pepin who foreshadowed earlier. His Holiness is a wondrous man of great knowledge and understanding, but I fear that he may someday take on some task that is too great even for him. Circling back to the priest's arrival, when Tremaine first appears after the player exits the cave due to his unique and dedicated quest called Flesh Doom, it's there we learn more about the priest's backstory, his impressive abilities, and why he was hated by demonic entities. As we first re-enter the town approaching Tremaine, he says, I have had a most disturbing experience that I must share with you, my friend. Earlier today, I was called upon to help one of the men that escaped from the labyrinth. He was deranged, violent, and kept lashing out at all of those who tried to calm him. I suspected that he was possessed by some sort of demonic entity, and so began to drive the evil from within him. After many hours, I was able to exorcise a demon who called himself Flesh Doom, but the Hellion fled into the labyrinth. You may think that I am mad, but after speaking with the man and battling with Flesh Doom, I believe that the labyrinth has somehow become a gateway to the underworld. As you descend deeper, you may find yourself upon the doorstep of hell itself. Finally, the man who was possessed retained memories of an ancient demon blade named Shadowfang. If you find the demon Flesh Doom, beware this foul sword. While I fear the dangers below grow even greater, you must find Flesh Doom and slay him. Bring the sword to me and I can destroy it, but do not wield it, for its power can corrupt absolutely. 
Now, there is a lot to unpack here, but for expediency's sake, I'm going to go with the cliff notes as I uncovered this entire quest of Tremaine's battle with the demon Flesh Doom, which will be linked at the end of the video. But the story beats are as such. A demon named Flesh Doom was exercised by Tremaine, a rather unique ability which I will circle back to. But the more pressing issues are there was a powerful blade created at the Hellforge called Shadowfang. What's interesting is that was the exact blade that is Wall attempted to stop from being created before being waylaid by demons, and this moment is of course immortalized in the game's manual, showing the first angel in the series and with pre-light wings thanks to Chris Metzen's artistry. With an exorcised demon back in hell, we hunt down Flesh Doom and engage in a bloody battle before returning to Tremaine. Flesh Doom's demise is a great good to the world, yet Shadow Fang remains. It must be found and destroyed. Do not attempt to use the Demon Blade, Champion. It will corrupt and madden any mortal who wields it. I alone can end its dark evil. Discovering the whereabouts of the Hellish Blade, we find we cannot even wield it. I can see why they fear this weapon. And as such, return the Cursed Blade to Tremaine to dire consequences. Light be praised! You found the Cursed Demon Blade! Only its destruction can ensure the safety of us all! Wait! What treachery is this? Oh! It burns! Hellfire! Consuming me! You must take this to the Hellforge and cast it in before... No! So this would be one possible grisly fate for Tremaine, tricked into going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a powerful demon, unaware all the while Hell was exacting their revenge for his meddling. This blade must be destroyed. But after all we have seen, why didn't Diablo's minions or the Dark Riders take care of the Holy Man earlier? Well, I believe it may have to do with his unique ability. As previously stated, Tremaine had the ability to perform exorcisms. I was asked to assist in the exorcism. My skills were able to ease the poor man's suffering as Tremaine drove the demon from his body. While I was treating him for an exceptionally high fever, he spoke of a place of searing heat. The tortured fellow cried out about hell and falling into a pit of flame. I could not make any sense of it, and thankfully he soon recovered. I heard that the priest Tremaine was going to perform an exorcism, but I didn't go. I don't see why we all have to spend every moment captive to what is lurking underneath our town. I know that many have died at the hands of these monsters, but we need to try to go on. I know that you have come here to free Tristram from the clutches of darkness, and I hope that one day we can live in peace again. I saw the exorcism. It was incredible how Tremaine drove the evil spirit from that man's racked and tortured body. I pray that something that horrific never happens to anyone here ever again. In fact, the Zacharoon faith closely followed Christianity, not just in aesthetic, but also a priest's ability to exorcise demons, which would be a powerful deterrent for the forces of hell. Consider the following. Four years ago, the countryside was overrun, but the town entered more of a terrible state of homogeny or a new normal. With a handful of citizens left, it was Tremaine alone who could travel between towns. Plus, he was only slated to appear here just as the hero would enter the final Hellmouth, which only opened when Diablo, who was weakened in Ulbricht's body after wrestling with Leoric's spirit, had gorged himself on the town's terror, so much so that he could rip the fabric of reality and create an outpost of Hell itself as his return drew near with the aligning of stars. And so it's not a stretch to think that Lazarus, a fellow priest of the Order, now corrupted by the Lord of Terror, would have strict instructions to make Tremaine believe that things were bad, but not dire, so he would not bring down the full force of the Zacharoom upon a vulnerable Diablo. No doubt Diablo probably believed at this point he was safe from the pitiful priest's powers of exorcism. Although formidable to lesser demons, it was as Adria hinted, perhaps Tremaine's faith in his abilities was over estimated. Faith is absolute belief in the unseen. The priest Tremaine is from a holy order long asleep in this land. He keeps a promise and a charge issued ages ago and sustains a union with realms that even my vision cannot reach. He knows much, but not as much as he believes. 
Tremaine's story, however, doesn't exactly end there. Although there are no further direct references to the priest in subsequent titles, when entering the town of Tristram, which was overrun in Diablo 2, we find most of the townsfolk accounted for, and indeed, there is a body where Tremaine would have stood as perhaps a wry reference to the ultimately cut priest. But more sinister, perhaps, is a certain blade, Shadowfang, which the warrior in Diablo 1 was tasked with destroying on the Hellforge, yet it makes its own appearance in Diablo 2. It seems the labours of one priest, who was a stalwart defender of the light until the end, was but another pawn or victim of Diablo's machinations, proving, like the rest of the poor townsfolk of Tristram, that time is no issue when you draw the ire of Hell itself. The priest Tremaine is a holy man from an ancient order. Their dealings with the evil forces at work are well respected and well documented. I too have heard legends that speak of the cursed demon blade called Shadow Fang. It is said to consume the tortured souls of its victims. These souls are trapped within its ebon blade and augment its unholy power. I have also read of a great hell forge where even the mightiest weapon could be created or destroyed. Tread carefully when dealing with Shadow Fang and its master, lest you be drawn into the sword as well. <laughs> 